Hi, we've been talking about the ways that we are still affected by popularity and why popularity is so important. And previously, we talked about the ways that it might really be built into how our brains are set up and even how our DNA responds and is expressed. But I want to move on by talking a little bit about how popularity is affecting each and every one of us actually thousands of times a day. Um, Specifically, we're going to talk about how your experiences with popularity when you were younger affect a lot of the ways that we think about our social experiences. But before we do that, I'd like for you to watch this video. Just watch the video and you're going to be asked to say a little bit about what you saw in the video. So watch carefully. So what we're going to talk about now has been studied by psychologists for many years, and it's referred to as social information processing. Nikki Crick and Ken Dodge were among the first to develop a model that's really a way of taking every single social experience you have and zooming it down into super slow-mo. So if you were to try and think about all of the tiny little unconscious processes that are happening between the moment that you see something and the moment that you respond, you would divide them up into a few different steps. So the first thing that happens is that there's an event. This could be a big event, like someone breaks up with you, or it could be a tiny little event, like you're walking through a crowd and someone nods at you. Very subtle. Turns out that in order for us to respond to that event, there are many little steps that happen. And the first one is whether or not we encode that event. So for instance, if you were walking through a crowd and someone nodded at you, you might not even notice it. You might be looking at somebody else, or you might be looking at your phone, answering emails, or you might be assuming that no one is interested in looking at you, so you don't really even attend to what happens. It's very common for professors to talk about uh, teaching in their class, and rather than noticing all of the students that are looking at them and kind of nodding, they really tend to focus on just those students that are looking down and clearly are doing Facebook while they're lecturing. That's a really great example of cue encoding, the idea that they tend to even just notice some things more than others and actually don't even see the other things in their visual field at all. Well, once we see something, once we've encoded something, and we've said that our brain has brought it to some attention to us, then we have to interpret what it is that we've seen or heard or felt. And we call that cue interpretation. And there are many different ways that we might interpret what it is that we've just encoded. And we'll talk about that more in just a second. Well, after we've interpreted something, then again, really fast, unconsciously, we don't even realize that we're doing it, we then decide what is our goal? What are we hoping to achieve in this particular situation? And that becomes an important step called goal clarification. Once we have a goal, we come up with a variety of possible things that we could do to respond. We select one of those responses. Again, super fast. We're not even aware we're doing it. And then we follow through on that with response enactment. So in other words, we decide to act out what it is that we say, uh, that we thought, rather, that we wanted to do. And once we respond, that often produces a new event. So for instance, if this all started by someone nodding at you, and you end up deciding to nod back, that might lead to them waving or saying hi or something like that. If you decide instead to do something rude to them, then that might lead to some sort of event where uh, it would start a whole news cycle, and it happens again and again. Well, all of this happens based on all of our prior experiences. So every single experience that we've had socially is stored in a database. And there's actually good brain research to say that when we look at how people respond to things, it often is involving centers of our brain involved in autobiographical memory. So we are very frequently drawing upon these old experiences, particularly, as it turns out, experiences with popularity, as a way to understand how every social experience happens to us every single day today. Now, sometimes we think about these steps very, very explicitly. We'll talk about that in a second. 
But first, let's talk about an example where we might see this play out, and I'm going to show you three different pretend people and how they might respond to a similar event. So for instance, imagine that someone walks by, they look at you, they smile, and they giggle a little bit. Well, imagine that in the cue encoding step, the first person might look at that and say, I just saw a person laughing at me. Okay, so they, because of their database, they really attended to the laughing. The second person might say, I just saw a person make eye contact and smile. So they didn't really remember the laughing as much. It, their studies show that if you ask them later, they might not even recall that that happened or they might not have even uh, noticed it. But they're really noticing the eye contact and the smile. And the third person, maybe they're the kind of person that doesn't believe that anyone would ever smile at them. They have a lifetime of rejection or feeling that they're never noticed by anybody. They are, studies show, less likely to even notice when people do look at them. So they might not even notice anybody. Well, the next step that would happen then is cue interpretation. So that first person might say, I think that person was making fun of me. You know, I saw them kind of laughing. And my automatic thought, the thing that I immediately associate with that is, I think they were, they were teasing me somehow. But maybe the second person who kind of was really noticing the eye contact and the smile might interpret that by saying, oh, I think maybe that person's flirting with me. And of course, the third person who didn't even see anybody would probably say, what person? I don't even know what you're talking about. So, you know, that's the end of them. The next step would be goal clarification. So if you believe that someone has just teased you, then that first person might say, well, in this situation, I want to assert my dominance. I really want to make sure that people don't tease me and they know that I'm not the kind of person that should really be treated that way. So maybe that's their goal. But you know, someone else might say, oh, well, I'm actually scared. You know, they tease me and I'm a little bit frightened or I feel really embarrassed or depressed, so I'm gonna go withdraw. I, I'm, I really wanna get out of the situation. That might be a different goal. The second person who saw the exact same event as something that had to do with flirting might say, oh, wow, they seem pretty hot. I wanna date them. So you know, that, that might be their goal in that situation. So these goals then lead to a variety of possible responses. And automatically in our brains, we kind of scan all the things we've done in that situation before, and we think about all the things that we might be able to do. So when thinking of all the possible responses, the first person might say, well, I could walk over and hit that person. Um, I could scream out at them, you know, oh yeah, you know, kind of like, don't do that to me. Or I could throw something at them or something like that. Uh, while the second person who thinks, oh, I think I'm being flirted with and my goal here is to try and get a date out of this, they might walk by that person and give them a smile back. They might scream out to them, oh, yeah. Or they might go hand them their number or you know, say that they want to text them or something like that. So usually after we scan all of the possible things that we can do, we come up with our response. Uh, we decide, okay, person number one says, I'm going to go throw my book at them. Uh, person number two might say, well, I've decided I should just smile at them. That's the best way to handle it. Interestingly, just because we've decided on what it is that we're going to do, that doesn't mean that's actually what we do. A lot of us have really good intentions to do a certain thing, but when we actually go and do it, it comes out a little bit different than we expected. So the person that decided to throw their book might decide to also scream out at the same time, you know, take that. Uh, whereas the second person might decide to smile back and also say something like, hey, how's it going, or something like that. So all these steps are happening really, really quickly. And what's interesting is that the reason why all these things occur are because of the experiences we've had before, and specifically the experiences we've had with popularity. And what we've learned is that we can predict how people will encode things, how they will interpret things, um, and so on, what goals they'll make and what responses they consider, select, and enact, all based on how popular they were as younger kids. That creates a template, a way of us interacting with the world, and it affects us thousands of times a day. Sometimes we think about this very seriously and very specifically. Um, so for instance, imagine you've gone on a first date, there may be some of these steps that you've debated about and ruminated about forever. You know, what did they mean by that text? And does that mean they like me or they don't like me? And what should I do? Should I say that back? Should I put a little emoticon? Does that seem I'm trying too hard? You know, all of these are ways that we think very specifically about these steps and even, you know, obsess over it sometimes. 
And that shows us that we really are engaging in these steps. But remember, most of the time it's happening automatically without us even realizing it. So here's an example. Before, I asked you to watch a little video. The video had a box. And around the box, there were three circles of different colors. It would have been perfectly appropriate to respond to that video that what you saw were three circles and a box. But most of us tend to anthropomorphize that video. We tend to see a story. But what story we see, the way that we interpret that stimulus, tells us a lot about ourselves. I have shown this video to many, many people over the years, and I want to give you a few examples of the ways that people will vary when they're asked to do the exact thing that I just asked you to do. Watch the video and just say what you saw. So for instance, some people will say, in a more neutral way, that they saw the red circle originally in the lead and the blue circle followed, then red tags green who followed and even gained the lead. Blue was very far behind and was left out of entering the square because the door closed before he got there. For instance, another person said, uh, red and blue circles went around the big circle once, they stopped, they picked up the green circle, all three circles went around the main circle once, finally red and green entered and closed the door. These are pretty neutral responses. Look how this contrasts with folks that said something that indicated maybe a low level of aggression. What they said was, the blue circle forced its way into the box, bounced around for a few seconds around the red and green circles. Red and green ran out and closed the entrance on blue. Or the blue circle tried to make others include him. He broke into the square and moved toward them. He threw himself against the sides of the square near where they're standing. The other circles didn't join them. They left the square. Here's another one. Blue forced its way into the room with green and red. Blue and green bumped shoulders until green was ready to leave with red because he didn't like hanging out with blue. Let me show you one more example. Here are people that saw the exact same video, but what they said suggested even more dramatic aggression. Here's what one person said. Okay. So red and green circle are chilling in the room. I think red is female. Blue is angry and feels left out. Clearly blames green circle for excluding it. Breaks into the room. Looks like there's violence between green and blue circles. They also, another person said, blue banged on the door and forced it open. Blue was very mad, bouncing all over the place. Green faced up to blue. Blue and green fought. Green and red left the room and closed the door on blue. You can take a look at some of these. Here's one of my favorite. Blue busted down the box in a violent, narcissistic rage and then provoked Green into a fight. Green was not in the mood for fighting because he was happy and friends with Red. Red chilled in the corner, scared of Blue. Then Green took Red out of the box. As you can see, these different scenarios uh, and the ways that people are describing them suggest that there are all kinds of attributions that we make. Just by seeing a simple video in which we all encoded the same information, three circles and a box. But the way that we interpret that is dramatically different. Some people thought that they saw circles of different genders. They assumed that one was a male, one was a female. Some of them assumed a lot of aggression. Some thought that they were just playing. All of that has a lot to do with what it was like for us growing up and how popular we were. So overall, hopefully this information is showing you that popularity, in fact, really still does matter. It's mattering in a way that's affecting every single social interaction that we have as adults, little by little. Our social experiences comprise a central database. We can change that database over time, but the database is overwhelmingly filled with experiences that happen when our brains became adult brains. And that was at the transition to adolescence. So the experiences we had as adolescents, which we mostly cared about popularity back then, they're the most important pieces of that database, which is why popularity plays a really big role at that point. That database tells us what we even see in the world around us, what we hear, how we interpret that, what goals we make, and what behaviors we think about, we select, and we decide to act on. We all have biases. Whether you're very, very popular or you are very unpopular, we all have different biases. The question is, what biases do you have? And are those biases things that are helping you in life, or are they hurting you and holding you back? Next, in the next video, I'll talk a little bit about some very common biases that we see, particularly among those who had trouble with popularity, and we'll talk about how those biases have affected people in adulthood.